Hello, everyone. I am Nancy Cordes, Chief White House Correspondent for CBS News, and I'm very pleased and honored to be here today at the sixth annual Reagan Institute Summit on Education in conversation with Secretary Rice and Secretary Spellings. It is a real honor. Uh, as many of you know, the pandemic exposed and ex exacerbated existing challenges and deficits within the U.S. education system. And today, we're going to look to the nation's next horizon and how we can recommit to excellence through access and achievement. It's a discussion that is happening around the country as the country attempts to rebound and reassess norms. And I'm so thrilled that we can have this conversation today with two great minds, two great experts. So welcome, secretaries, to the two of you. Well, thank, thank you very you. much. It's, it's great to be with you. And we will dive right in. I, I want to start out by asking you about accountability and data, which are uh, two things that were really at the heart of the nation at risk study all these years ago. Uh, I'm wondering if you could both talk about your definition of student success now and how you think it has changed since that report came out. What should we be measuring today and are we measuring it properly? Well, I, I will uh, start in and say that, you know, it's always the case that we need to know how well our students are prepared in reading and math in particular. Uh, we're going to get into civics and history at some point today in this conversation. And, uh, you know, what's different today than the nation at risk is that we have, we must have higher expectations for every single student. You know, back when the nation at risk report was released, you could still make a pretty good living with a high school diploma, that is no longer the case. And as our country has gotten more diverse, richer in uh, in those senses, we have you know challenging students that we need to meet where they are and make sure that they have the skills to participate in a very dynamic economy. I think we need to think uh, more carefully. Uh, obviously, basic skills, as as. Margaret said, if you can't read, if you can't do basic math, then you're pretty much done. And unfortunately, too many of our kids in grade three and uh, in third grade already can't do that. And we know that if you can't read by the time you're third grade, you're going to have a terrible time catching up. So I do think we need to reemphasize basic skills. Uh, but I also think we need to recognize for older kids that the job market is different now. Uh, that we are going to have to think about skills of, for instance, uh, being able to use technology. Almost any job these days involves some technology. My uncle taught auto mechanics back in the days when Alabama had vocational education. And he told me that in his last years of teaching, which was now fully 20 plus years ago, he no longer just told them, get under the car with a wrench and bang around. They had to do diagnostics on on a computer. And so are we really uh, making certain that the kids' skills uh, as they enter the workforce are up to date with the jobs that are going to be available? Not all of them, by the way, which will require a college degree. Many of them will simply require uh, that they have skills that can be certified perhaps by industry. And I think we don't do enough in, uh, in really deciding for uh, for different pathways for uh, our students. Given those new challenges and those new expectations, how do we make sure that we have uh, new metrics and the right metrics and that we are measuring uh, the right skills and the right aptitudes? Well, you know, it's really been challenging post-COVID because I think we all saw, obviously, how central our, our schools are, but their, you know, mental health challenges became quite prominent, but they're they're certainly uh, acute and deserve our attention, but they're not a substitute for can you read, can you cipher, do you have some basic knowledge that allows you to participate in, in the world. So I'm very hawkish about our continued need to, to measure and report and hold ourselves accountable. And one of the things that I think was the greatest gift of the Nation at Risk report and, and the work of President Reagan was shining the spotlight in a very, very stark and clear and, and shocking and scary way. Uh, and, and frankly, and sadly, you know, there's still a lot of truth in, 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 to that. 
uh, to our needs and uh, the gap between what Americans think about the quality of their schools and the experiences of their ch own children and their actual readiness for work and life. And, uh, you know, Margaret, of course, is uh, is expert at matters of uh, K-12 education and has fought the good fight about uh, accountability, about measurement. Uh, this should not actually be an ideological issue. Uh, I've never understood why it's an ideological issue left or right that if you are teaching kids math, you need to know whether they're learning something. And we've put another layer on top of it now that somehow it's inequitable in terms of racial or other categorizations to measure because if kids don't do well on it, uh, we somehow are being inequitable. No, I would say if they don't do well, go back and help them to do well. Uh, nobody uses, should use uh, accountability measures, whether it's for teachers or for students, at, punitively. I think instead you use it as a way to assess where uh, things are and then you move forward. And I'm sort of at the other end of the production line, if you will, because I'm a university professor. Uh, and even at a fine university like, like Stanford, I can tell you that the writing skills are not that great. Uh, they can make subject and verb agree but they don't really know how to sustain an argument. And uh, we'll get to, to civics and history, but uh, some of the gaps, uh, we always tend to think about the STEM side, which is incredibly important, but some of the gaps in the kind of basic knowledge of how history unfolded, it's really a threat to our democratic institutions uh, not to know that. And so um, I, the, the Nation at Risk was, uh, was a wake up call. Um, I'm, I'm not sure we didn't just after a while kind of hit the snooze button um, and uh, we've still got an awful lot of work to do. Well, let's talk about civics and history. Uh, is it time for national standards about, um, you know, what students need to learn at a minimum about uh, the nation and the world and, um, and our, our shared history? And should that be tested as well? Well, well, I'll start quickly. You know, just a week or so ago, the the new NAEP results came out, the our nation's education report card, and it was very, very distressing news. I mean, in the wrong direction for the first time since the mid '90s, and you know, both in civics and in history. And you know, if ever there was a time when we needed, and I'll obviously Condi can speak to this far better than I, you know, cohesion around our values, our history, our common threads and so forth it is now and and you know we need a much greater sense of urgency around these issues they're obviously also related to how well can kids read and and understand what they're what they're consuming and so it's about content and it's about skill i think it's also uh about getting adults again to stop making uh essentially ideological arguments about the teaching of civics and history uh if you are a citizen in a democracy you need to understand that country's history you need to understand its institutions and you need to understand it in a way that both uh, reflects the complexity of our history um, and uh that doesn't pull any punches about parts of our history that are are, are fairly dark um i i grew up in birmingham alabama we moved when i was 12. And the fourth grade textbook was called No Alabama. Now, apparently, uh, there was no slavery in Alabama, uh, according to No Alabama, because it's not even mentioned in that fourth grade textbook. So no, we don't need to go, we're not going to go back to that. But we also need to understand when we're talking about the complexity of the mores, the, the moral uh, compass of people of the late 18th century and early 19th century, that it was different. And we need to understand that even if our country had a birth defect of slavery, which it did, that these institutions are still incredibly powerful, uh, that the Constitution, which uh, basically protected the rights of uh, white male landowners uh, in 13 states, now protects the, the rights we the people is a really now kind of broad concept. It includes me, it includes the, the two of you, which uh, we've had a hard time getting there, but we've done it through our institutions. And to just toss them aside and either say, well, they're elitist and they don't really represent you, which would be one set of arguments, or they're so soiled by the way that they came into being that they're not worth preserving. 
that will be the death of our democracy because you do have to have some common sense, uh, common purpose in uh, undergirding any uh, any democracy. Really interesting point because um, you know when you talk about common sense and common purpose, we see this trend. Uh, at, at the local level, in some school boards around the country towards wanting to create their own standards based on their own ideological views rather than on a, a more broadly held understanding of best practices that have been established by, uh, by experts at, at, a, at more of a, a national level, if you will, or even a state level. And so how do you deal with that trend when obviously uh, we want to encourage local uh, participation in education. Obviously so much of, of the decision making about education takes place at the local level. So how do you balance those uh, those two needs? Well, I, I, I'll weigh in. I bet obviously I just want to endorse the beautiful and eloquent way that Condi just framed all of that in, our, in the previous answer. You know, the truth of the matter is, yes, there's a lot of smoke and there's a lot of, uh, you know, drama around local school boards and books and this and that. But the truth of the matter is we have state standards in every single state that are required with all humility, as part of No Child Left Behind. It was a hugely important, majorly bipartisan reform. So state standards exist in all cases and, and frankly haven't really been opened up at a state level in these recent arguments. We also have, very importantly, our National Education Report Card. That's why the results and the data from last week in civics and history are so important. It's a sample, it can't be taught to, and uh, it has told us some disturbing news. An underheralded and very important part of No Child Left Behind was the requirement that every single state participate in the NAEP. That wasn't the case before that law. And so we have, you know, some pretty good uh, data and information and structures through state standards and through the National Education Report Card. Let me uh, throw back at Margaret the compliment about uh, the work that she did when she was uh, in, in Washington. Uh, it, it really does harken back to a time when we took common sense approaches to these things, right? When it wasn't kind of, oh, I'm going to just be the one who yells the loudest. Now, I do think that some of what you're seeing at the local level is frankly a reaction to what I would even call some politicization of the curriculum in our schools. Uh, you know, we ought to be able to get to a place where uh, we don't have the standard of, as I said, no Alabama, uh, there was no slavery, uh, or on the complete 180 degrees, the country was founded only to protect slavery, right? So someplace in between there, uh, there's actually a set of arguments about our founding that probably we could all agree to. And one of the things that I think we need to do, and we're trying to do more of this at the Hoover Institution, is we, we need to go back and do some research on uh, some of the issues that are out there and try, to, try to, to give some light rather than so much heat. We have a very active K-12 education uh, program, and we do have as a part of that program something called Unheard Voices. Uh, which is to listen to parents, uh, to listen to uh, local officials about what their concerns are about the uh, about the educational enterprise. Uh, but ultimately, we have to try to get to as fact based uh, an approach as we possibly can. And uh, we are losing sight of how many uh, facts we actually could agree on because there's so much so much heat. And um, I'm hoping that we can pull back. I know Margaret is doing a lot of great work in Texas, 2030, uh, Texas 2036 on, on these issues. We're doing the work. There are lots of people who are putting that work in. We need to bring some of that research back to the table uh, in the way, by the way, that um, the, the Reagan uh, report did uh, bring experts together to, to talk about these issues. Yeah, can I just add, build on that and say that, you know, one of our very important institutions is our higher education institutions, where we are looking to them for scholarship, for leadership, for the sorting and sifting of finding those things that are that are common for all of us. And I think it's a great role that Hoover can and does play. Um, and, you know, we need to be looking to our scholar 
uh, around the country to help settle these, settle all of this down so we can get back to the work of, you know, finding those things in common and teaching our kids to be able to access and, and uh, build on that, that learning. Uh, you know, Secretary Rice, since you brought up uh, parents, I, I do want to ask you about the role of parents, because it does seem, um, as a parent myself of two middle schoolers, that the um, the role of parents, at least as the parents it's, themselves view it, has changed over time. And um, there, there used to be uh, more of a hands-off approach and an assumption that the teacher probably knows best to parents who are more apt to uh, to weigh in, make their feelings known, express how they feel, you know, much in the same way that people across society feel more comfortable weighing in about everything on social media uh, and everywhere else. So I'm wondering how you see uh, the role of the parent in education, um, what you think the right role uh, for parents is in education, how you think it, uh, this, you know, increased um, uh, you know, and more more vocal parent body of today is helpful and detrimental to education. Um, and actually, I'd be curious, Secretary Rice, what kind of an impact it has in higher education as well. Well, obviously, in higher education, we're seeing it too. Um, I, I have colleagues who talk about the fact that they never expected to hear from somebody's parents about the internship that they needed. Uh, so yes, parents are clearly more involved. But uh, look, I, I have to tell you, I'm not sure I'm competent to say I don't have kids. I have godsons, and I watch that situation. I will tell you, my parents were really involved. Um, now, they were teachers. And there was a kind of sense that the, that we were in this together, teachers and parents. We used to have something called parent-teacher associations, PTAs, and some of these work, some of this work could get uh, done in those local organizations. I think what's happened is that in, and I, I would guess that given the way social media operates, the way cable news works, that that if you were to look at the whole range, the whole number of these uh, interactions that in fact the ones that get all of the news are a relatively small number of really intense uh, confrontational relationships between schools and parents and that most of it goes along fairly um, fairly uh, quietly uh, but uh, I do think parents were in part um, mobilized by what they saw during COVID. Uh, now they were home now they saw what was going on. Uh, they didn't always like what they saw in the classroom. And so they were mobilized to speak about it. It's probably not a smart thing to say they have no right to speak about it because ultimately we do depend on the parents to raise their children. But I think that is the moment at which parents thought, well, why am I not more involved in this? And for parents also who, um, who were able to, to stay home with their kids and try to help teach them and so forth. Uh, you know, I'm in California. The fact that the kids were out of the classroom for so long is just devastating. Uh, I work a lot with boys and girls clubs and we have a summer academy that um, some friends and I help sponsor out at one of the boys and girls clubs here. And uh, last summer, the, the uh, staff were telling us just getting kids able to concentrate again um, is really difficult after COVID. And so I, I think there's a reason for this parent mobilization. I suspect that it is less fraught than is sometimes portrayed in a few examples. But um, I would not subscribe to the idea that uh, education, quote, has to be left to the experts. I do think parents have a role to play in the education of their kids. One of the things that was really uh, it, it powerful coming out of COVID is around reading. I don't know. I'm sure many of the people that are watching have heard about and and listened to sold a story. The 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 kind of you know ongoing debate we have about phonics versus whole language and how students are taught to read that has beget and in, in very positive ways a real look at what does the research tell us about how little children learn to read? Are we using it to teach them? Uh, both in our teacher prep institutions and our universities and in our classrooms and are the materials reflective of that best science and so there's been an awakening around that issue which will which will really be to the to the good of our of our children what do you think of of that debate and where the 
the evidence comes down. And for people who are watching who don't know about it, um, there was a LeVar Burton documentary in Oakland that talked about how uh, students used to be taught using uh, phonics and phonetics to learn words and um, that the U.S. got away from that. Uh, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Secretary of Spellings, because you know more about this than I do. But, uh, you know, we moved to a system where it was more about recognizing uh, entire words and that um, over time there was evidence that showed that students, particularly minority students, were uh, were not learning to read at the same level of competency that they had under the old system. Now states are moving back to that original phonics and phonetic system. Do I have that basically right? You basically have that right. And the science and the evidence is pretty conclusive. It came to us from the National Academies uh, in Science and National Institutes of Health. Uh, it wasn't a bunch of educators. <laughs> it was a bunch of scientists who understood the brain and how uh, little people acquire reading and language skills. And so, yeah, that's right. And, you know, of course, you have to have that skill and then you read and practice and comprehend and so on. So at some level, it's a it's a both uh, we want students to love literature and love to read and, you know, so on, but we also need them to have the skill. Yeah, I would just uh, pick up on that, uh, but not as much from the perspective of reading. Uh, I read, a, I did read all of the, that debate, uh, but uh, it seemed to me that it exposed something that Margaret just uh, mentioned and I'd underscore, which is the degree to which we could actually start to use technology uh, and scientific research to better understand the learning process. Uh, so the, you know, here at a place like Stanford, uh, we are doing so much work in the imaging of the brain and how do people actually learn. And <clears throat> one thing I think we're going to have to deal with is a lot of people think that kids learn differently now uh, because they've had that little thing called a smartphone in their hand since they came out of the womb. And so uh, we we really do need to access the best science on how learning takes takes place. And we can even use it, I believe, to think about more personalized learning. So um, I, I'm actually pretty good at math, but the one thing I could never get was geometry. And I didn't know the difference between a parallelogram and a square, and I still don't. Uh, if I had been able to pace a little bit better in my learning, it would have been better for me. And there are a lot of places that are um, experimenting with self-pacing of students so that not everybody learns at the same speed, not everybody learns the same way. And that, I think, could be uh, beneficial. Now, I'd be the first to say, since my mother was a teacher, you know, she would probably roll her eyes and say, oh, yes, good, another thing that I have to worry about in the classroom. But if we could actually make some of those tools, make the teaching uh, activities easier for teachers or more efficient for teachers, uh, I think there's a lot of work to be done between experts in K-12 education and experts in data science and neuroscience in particular that could really uh, pretty quickly improve uh, some of our outcomes. When it comes to technology, obviously one of the things that everybody is talking about right now is artificial intelligence and what its potential impact will be or even what its current impact is on education, uh, particularly on higher education, but I think really at all levels. And it's it's something that we're just beginning to understand. How do you think about uh, both the potential drawbacks and the potential benefits of AI uh, as it pertains to education? And how is education going to have to change its focus and the purpose of preparation to deal with the emergence of AI? Well, I live in Silicon Valley, and um, I live at a university where AI is uh, around every corner, it, it <laughs> seems. And um, mm -hmm. I've actually, uh, we here at Hoover are doing a lot of work around this question of frontier technologies, and not just AI, but synthetic biology and others, and how they will affect the way that we live, uh, how we will deal with the economy, how we'll deal with learning. Um, I'm actually optimistic that if we can get the balance right, these are tools that can dramatically improve uh, education in the ways that we were talking about, dramatically improve healthcare. Um, but human beings have always been a lot better at the knowledge part than the wisdom part. And so I do worry that uh, these technologies are sprinting out ahead so quickly 
that our institutions may not be catching up and we need to really engage and and um and promote those uh, those conversations between those who understand the institution, social scientists, and the people who are actually creating uh, these frontier technologies. I was at a, a, a meeting uh, not too a couple weeks ago of AI specialists, and to be frank, I understood about half of what they said, uh, but I did understand one thing that they said, which is that some of them were talking about trying to slow down or even pause. And I said, well, why would you do that? They said, because these machines are so powerful, we're not sure they could control them. Well, my first reaction was, I thought that was science fiction, uh, but I guess not. And so uh, if this is happening that quickly, uh, we're gonna have to have adaptation. You'd think of something like, um, you know, chat GPT and its, its progeny. Uh, I do have colleagues who worry that they won't be able to tell whether an essay was written, written by their student or written with an AI algorithm. Um, I'm told that there are ways to tell, but uh, that you have to be pretty sophisticated about that, and that in time, those ways to tell will be taken away because they'll improve uh, the technology so that you really can't uh, distinguish. So we've got some really hard issues ahead of us, not just in education, but as a society. And I think um, making sure that we have those conversations is important. And also ethically, we maybe have to start saying more to our students. You know, cheating was a problem, it's been a problem as long as probably education has been taking place. But this kind of, we, we have to tell our students ethically, this isn't okay uh, to use this technology and then claim that it is your uh, product. And uh, so more in that way, uh, more normative work with students, I think is going to be important too. Nancy, I also want to add, I'm on the Common Sense Media Board and had the opportunity to chair with Jim Steyer and Deval Patrick, uh, former governor of Massachusetts, a, a future of tech commission. And, you know, our rules are and laws are really antiquated and not have not kept up with the kind of policy issue that we really need to to be tackling, certainly around AI, but also around our algorithms and privacy and age limits for kids and, you know, parental rights around some of those things. And I'm encouraged that there's, you know, beginning to be some real uh, bipartisan comity around this issue, because we have a lot of work to do and our, our regulatory and legal landscapes are not set up. Uh, and it's it's the wild west at the moment, but we can. Uh, I would commend uh, that work to to the audience. You know, while I was reading through a uh, back through a nation at risk, uh, I was struck by the fact that one of the things it really focused on was the need to pay teachers a competitive wage. Obviously, uh, here we are, decades later, that has not happened. I, I think it's fair to say. Um, many teachers are dramatically underpaid, um, and it obviously became uh, even more of a flashpoint during the pandemic when uh, teachers uh, started leaving the profession um, as their jobs got even harder. So I I'm wondering if you can talk about um, how you see teacher pay affecting the uh, quality of education that we need to have, and also whether you think there is anything that can be done to change that trajectory in a meaningful way. Go ahead, Gandhi. No, no, go ahead, Mark. <laughs> oh, I was just gonna say, I, you know, it's a perennial issue. It's as true today as it was then and, and will continue to be. Uh, so yes, we need to pay our teachers more. We need to have their working conditions better and uh, et cetera. But I do think we're in the middle of, a, you know, what I call, you know, greater distribution of education where we're going to see, you know, different ways of through with technology, with pods, with smaller groups, with charters, with, you know, other options. And we have, you know, kind of hidebound structures in education where we say to teachers, we want you to come for 180 days under these conditions. And this is what the, and we've got to start breaking that up. We have to say, you know, can Condi Rice come and teach in the spring semester, you know, middle school social studies, because there's a lot of talent like that in our and how do we start to think about uh, a more a la carte way of educating students? And obviously our teachers are precious, but 
I don't, I don't believe personally that we're going to be able to use these same old models to meet the needs of a growing, diverse, and highly, you know, adaptive uh, learning environment. We just can't do it the old way anymore. I come from a family of teachers, and I still have cousins who are uh, teachers in, in school systems. And it's interesting. Yeah, they want to be paid more, and they should be paid more. But they complain more than that about the administrative load that's put on them, uh, the fact that they are supposed to be uh, not just educating our students, but they are kind of the social services uh, uh, place where everything, whatever's happening in the family, whatever, that they're supposed to be responsible for that as well. Uh, the number of mandates that are put on them. Uh, the I have one one cousin who teaches in the Birmingham public school system. And you know, by the time she finishes her day, it's eight or nine o'clock at night. Uh, because she's just got so much to do that doesn't actually have to do with the basics of teaching the student. So I wonder if some of this is, it, it's not as if people who go into teaching think they're going to make money like venture capitalists, right? They know better. They should be paid better, but we also ought to make the conditions under which they teach uh, somewhat uh, somewhat easier. Uh, we uh, we also, I think, uh, need to really think about principles. This is something that Margaret taught me, uh, that uh, a lot, sometimes the real key or the real unlocking of potential in a school is really to get a principal who is really dynamic and good and has ideas. But then we constrain that person in what they can do. And so if we could allow more creativity with with teachers, if we could take some of the load of trying to deal with all society's ills right there in the classroom, uh, we we might be able to make it uh, more palatable for people to stay in the teaching profession, um, even uh, if wages are, uh, are not dramatically higher. Secretary Spellings, how do you do that uh, at, a, at a practical level? Is this something that, that needs to be changed um, uh, on a school by school basis, are there some? Uh, does it does it mean that you need more administrative staffing at schools? Where does the money come from uh, for that? How do you address that that challenge that that teachers face? I think it's a number of things. On some of those bureaucratic administrivia issues, a lot of that is state policy, some of which is federal policy, and some of which is local policy. So, I mean, I know in Texas, we literally ask our teachers to track the number of minutes that are spent on on particular things. I mean, for goodness sake, it wasn't always like that. That was a fairly recent reform, but it is, it's burdensome and it can get in the way of, you know, the main thing being the main thing. And so I do think, you know, a review, uh, you know, sunsetting processes, those sorts of things that can allow us to kind of take a hard look at them. I think that's important at all levels. Um, and, and also, I think, you know, we have to prioritize things like le school leadership, as I used to say, show me a good school and I'll show you a good principal, show me a good principal and I'll show you a good school. And so investing in that management, just like you would in any other enterprise, you know, great people want to work for somebody who's creative, who uh, understands how to how to lead and, and those sorts of things. And, you know, we have significant attrition in our uh, principal core as well. So, you know, we can all do our part by elevating the importance of these roles. Uh, you know, the future of our country depends on folks that are of goodwill and good heart and high intellect showing up and doing this work. Secretary Spelling, one of the things that you've written about is the need for uh, especially higher education to have respect for the policymakers who, you know, hold the purse strings and uh, and vice versa. Uh, how do you see that relationship right now, particularly in Texas? And uh, and and what are you doing at at, at either Texas twenty thirty six or um, you know more broadly in the state to improve that relationship in order to improve outcomes? Well, uh, you know, higher education governance in the public sector is you know clearly an important issue these days. We see it in Florida, Texas, North Carolina, South Carolina, <laughs> lots of places. You know, pick up the Chronicle of Higher Ed on any given day. Uh, Condi is somewhat immune to it. Well, maybe she's not immune to it. It's just not in the newspaper. <laughs> so, uh, but but I, th I think a couple of things. One, you know, better data, clearer understanding between our K-12, our community college and our post-secondary and our workforce systems. You know, what are we doing? How do they connect to, to pathways, better information? That's always true. Uh, and, and I think, again, 
uh, you know, brand is starting to matter less. Skill is starting to matter more. There's more of an a la carte kind of mentality when we see companies like Google and others, you know, create their own credentialing systems and, and whatnot. So it's really an exciting time. I don't want to be a downer about any of this stuff. There's so much to be, you know, enthusiastic and optimistic about. Um, and we can we can close the achievement gap. We can make sure that uh, our people have better opportunities uh, through education. I, yeah, I would just add that uh, one thing that makes uh, higher education with all of its problems and and all of its challenges still uh, the kind of uh, the gold standard internationally, uh, the American higher education system is. Uh, I can tell you how many, uh, leaders of countries want to send their kids to school in the United States. It's uh, it is the gold standard, and I do think there's something for K twelve to learn from the way that higher ed is educated or is is uh, is uh, created. Higher ed is actually uh, varied. Uh, you can go to a small college. You can go to a small liberal arts college. You can go to a big research university. You can go to a private research university. You can go to a community college. I mean, there are so many options. And one feels a little bit that the K-12 system is stuck in a, uh, a series of uh, structures, uh, options that date back to when kids had to go take the harvest in before they could go to school. Uh, you know, I look at the fact that I think we still have the, the shortest learning day uh, mm -hmm. in the, in the uh, developed world. We certainly have the shortest learning year. Uh, we keep adding holidays. Um, I not too jokingly said in California, I'm pretty sure that Cesar Chavez and Martin Luther King actually might have wanted kids to go to school on their birthday. <laughs> uh, and so I, I think we have to look at the variety that you have in higher ed. Um, the choices that are possible for students and say, couldn't we transfer just a little bit of that flexibility into the K-12 education system? Yeah, I mean, I was I was actually talking to a, a friend who runs a, a technical community college in preparation for this conversation. And one of the things uh, that he stressed are uh, is the fact that community colleges and universities have actually gotten a lot better um, at integrating with their states and their local agencies and local businesses to say, uh, what do you need? What kinds of skills uh, are are you looking for? We'll teach them um, and so that, you know, it's a it's a two way street and, and that you making sure that you are um, preparing people to um, to go out in a workforce that is going to uh, actively welcome their skills. Um, that seems like that is a, a bright spot. But as you say, Secretary Rice, we have to make sure that now backing up a step that uh, primary and secondary education are feeding into that pipeline as well. Yes. I, th I think what your friend described to you is uh, really a model that we ought to be understanding more. And, and there are some very uh, specific and quite formal structures between a company um, and, and the community college. It, teach these skills and give a certificate and there will be a job, an apprenticeship, and then a job waiting. Uh, we need to do more than that, uh, more of that. One of the things that sometimes comes out of that is, well, the German system, since, since I'm an international, and the German system is great with these uh, apprenticeships and so forth, but there's a part of it that will never be quite right in America, which is that kids are tracked mm -hmm. by the time they're 12 or 13 years old. You're going to go into the vocations. You're going to go into... Uh, into uh, preparation for college. We don't want to do that either because we want, first of all, to leave room that at 17 or 18, you might show promise for uh, a four-year college that you didn't show uh, when you were 13 or 14. Uh, you might show an, a desire to go that you would not have known when you were 13 or 14. And then we need to give people an opportunity to uh, work for a while and maybe go back to uh, continuing education so that they keep upskilling as well. And, and I've been arguing to CEOs when I speak to them that uh, before you automate your workforce out of existence, because we know that the real threat to workforce development is automation. It's actually not globalization, it's automation. Uh, before you automate your workforce out of existence, how about you upskill them? How about you retrain them? 
And I think if companies can take responsibility for some of that, uh, you will see that the most ambitious a uh, worker who maybe just didn't have the skills when they first went to work, maybe came from a not very good school system, but shows that drive and that energy and that desire to get better, that there's still a pathway for them that's up, not just sideways. Right, Secretary right, Spellings? I just want to mega ditto that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I know we're running short on time, so I, I wanted to close... Um, Secretary Rice, was something that you said recently, you said, quote, it's a tremendous benefit to have people from different backgrounds and perspectives. We want to continue to emphasize that diversity and excellence are not at odds with one another. How do both of you see the role of diversity, equity, and inclusion departments in higher education right now? I know that this is such a, a flashpoint um, in, in some states. And how do you think that universities should respond and adjust if, in fact, the Supreme Court does rule against affirmative action in admissions soon? Well, let me start that. I mean, Margaret was a university chancellor, so she should answer as well. But let, let me just start by saying look, diversity, I think, is a good. I, I actually believe the more diverse experiences and people you can have, the better. I will say that we should use diversity not to emphasize difference but to emphasize that we come from different places to a common place. And I don't like actually the language anymore. I, I don't use the word inclusion anymore. And I'll tell you why. What are we trying to describe? We're trying to, let's define it. We're talking about an atmosphere, circumstances in which everybody can be respected and everybody can be successful. I would rather define it these days because it's become a kind of buzzword. And it's become a buzzword for those people need to be included by those people who have been uh, have not included them and becomes confrontational rather than it's all of our responsibility, whatever color we are, whatever gender we are, to actually provide uh, and to contribute to that environment of respect and success. And so I like to think of it as more of a two-way street. And uh, I also think that we have to recognize that when you talk, for instance, about racial diversity, you know, sometimes I look at my kids who've gone to Exeter and are now at Stanford, and I say, really? Uh, you really want to talk about oppression? Why don't you go work at the Boys and Girls Club and see what it really is to struggle? So the whole language around it, I don't like the racialization of everything, because we've spent 150 years trying to get out of just racial categories. And so it would be very good if we thought instead of diversity as towards something common. Now, I personally would prefer to see that the courts not overturn um, affirmative action in its very limited way after the Michigan decision. And it's largely because I would like to see universities capable of designing their own classes. Uh, it's actually not so easy to figure out how to put together a class where you're going to have um, kids of geographic diversity and first gen kids. And so I don't like more constraint on that, but I understand how it happened. Uh, quotas are not a good thing, uh, but maybe there is a way to talk about um, constructing a class uh, where we can count all kinds of, um, all kinds of characteristics, including by, including by the way, uh, ideological diversity, which is sorely missing in American universities these days. Let me just pick up from there and 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 obviously agree with Condi on all of that, but but say that you know if the the court is going to uh, you know change the current practice, you know what what do we do? And and here in Texas, we were on the front end, and obviously then North Carolina was, you know, a major player in this. Is how do we solve for creating a class that is diverse that it, that creates an experience that we want our kids to have when they're young adults, so that they can be effective and. When we look at things like to 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 build on Condi's example about the you know the Exeter Stanford person, when we look at families you know kids from first generation homes, uh, indicators that are not you know solely based on, on race, we can and have uh, you know tools in our toolkit. Top ten percent of the class in high school, uh, irrespective of what the of what that school is like, and it has the effect of creating. Uh, you know, a, a more diverse uh, student body 
without uh, factoring in race uh, often. But, you know, it, to me, higher ed administrators ought to have, uh, you know, a lot of tools in their toolkit. It is, it's art and science, and we all want to be able to be fair and transparent with how we admit students, but also make sure that we're, you know, creating an, a, a, a learning environment that really is going to be rich for, for them. Well, on that weighty and, and eloquent note, I want to thank you, Secretary Spellings, and uh, you, Secretary Rice, for uh, taking time out of your very busy schedules to uh, to join me today to talk about the state of education. It's been a really fascinating conversation, and I want to thank the audience as well. Thank, thank you, Nancy. You very much. That's great, Nancy. Congratulations thank you. Thank you. to the Reagan Institute. Condi, it's always great to be with you, my friend. Uh, likewise, and uh, the Reagan Institute continues to do great work. And so thanks a lot to everybody who's there. Have a great day, everybody. All the best.